to call, uh, welcome all the speakers who are going to be uh, ahead of me. Uh, this will be a talk on the uh, cardiovascular collapse uh, during an epidural, which is, could be a nightmare for us. Uh, we s <coughs> always think that the epidural space is one which is uh, 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 one which is very safe to um, anesthetize, and then we feel that the patients are always, are always safe. But at times, we always see that sometimes the patients do collapse. So, what could be the reason? Now, the epidural space exactly it starts developing during the embryonic period at the uh, stage 19 of the embryo. You can see that, and then it goes on to develop a very well uh, developed space, which is surrounded by the ligament of uh, phlegm over there. Uh, the government and phlegm over there and then we have this epidural space and the spinal space where we anesthetize. We can keep the catheters at both the places but routinely we keep the catheters in the epidural space. Now uh, this is a, a, a in, the, in the cadaver you can see that this is a placement of the, in the thoracic epidural but as mentioned by the previous speakers also you can have gaps in between and this is one which can cause problems in the uh, perioperative period where you cannot feel the uh, click of the ligament and phlegm and you directly land into the dural sac and then uh, you may or may not uh, be able to uh, catheterize the, 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 these patients. The characteristic, characteristic uh, spread of the epidural space is one where the when you inject the contrast near the cervical epidural, you can see that it delineates the roots, it delineates the lateral aspect, it delineates the anterior and the posterior as well. So that is the characteristic spread of the uh, contrast in the epidural spread. So just keep this slide in, in mind when you, you see the other slides as well. Now the problems with the uh, uh, the the the, uh, the catheterization in the epidural space is that you can sometimes have this uh, uh, CSF uh, which leaks out uh, when you catheterize, particularly patients with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and with ankylosing spondylitis. These are the patients in whom the ligament uh, phlegm is very thin, and you can l l there is a possibility of uh, a, a, a dural uh, dural tap. The next is one where usually in the, in the post-operative period what I do is that when, uh, <coughs> when you shift the patient on the infusion pump, I always aspirate and then we try to see. Now this patient had a, a, a catheter migration in the, in, in the perioperative period which lasted for almost four to five hours. Uh, the surgery which lasted for four to five hours and then they had, a, uh, uh, you can see that the CSF was being aspirated at the end of the procedure so that this again had to be uh, done, the epidural space had to be again catheterized. So these things have to be kept in mind and you cannot send this patient on an infusion pump in the uh, immediate post-operative period. Now excessive manipulations of the catheter, now this is a histological sl slide of the epidural space, this is the epidural space here, that is the epidural vein, this is an artifact, that is the dura and this is the spinal cord. So the uh, excessive manipulations in the epidural space is likely to traumatize this vein, so you get those epidural vein cannulations many of the times and it's also likely to traumatize the dura and you can, uh, you can have an intrathecal, uh, intrathecal catheter. So keep in mind that there has to be no excessive manipulations of the catheter in the epidural space. Now. We had some cases of total spinal. I had in the last 15 years, I had three cases who had a total spinal. And in this case, you have an abrupt onset of uh, dense motor block, profound hemodynamic changes, you know that, and the respiratory arrest. So catheters can migrate in the intraoperative as well as in the, in the post-operative period. The punctures of the subarachnoid space is, uh, is said to be around 0.2 to 0.3 percent. And in, in this case, whether to go a space above or a space below is still co is, is quite controversial. I usually go, if there is a dual puncture, I go always a space above because if you go a space below, there is likely uh, of the catheter migration again in the uh, in, in intrathecal space. The total spinal blocks have developed at 8 minutes, at 40 minutes, and then uh, um, uh, the total spinal, which took less than 15 minutes to develop. And there was a, a report uh, in, in the labor, in the patient was in labor, that at the fourth dose, the patient developed a total spinal. So you have to be very cautious when you give your top-ups in the post-operative period or keep the patients on continuous infusion pumps. Now, in a few of the cases like these, uh, which I came across, now this was a, 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 a case where the lumbar was cannulated at L3, L4, 10 ml was uh, injected, and the patient developed hypotension, brady, as well as a difficulty in respiration. In the post-operative period, I tried to do a, a contrast study. I found that the, uh, the contrast spread along only the posterior uh, space. There was no spread across the anterior. There is no uh, spread across the nerve roots. It spread only across the, uh, uh, the posterior space. Another patient for hemiarthroplasty uh, had successfully done just doing the top-up uh, when I gave around 5 ml of 1.5% uh, solicin. 25 minutes later, the patient landed in a severe cardiorespiratory arrest. CPCR was successfully done and uh, the surgery was, uh, was performed. But what could have caused the, uh, the arrest or what could have caused the respiratory problems? When I injected the contrast, you can see now this is the uh, lumbar area and this is, this is the thoracic area. There is a thin contrast which uh, delineates the space here. There is the accumulation of some contrast here and then again it spreads high up in the cervical area. So you can see that the thin line uh, from the low uh, at the level of L3, L4 goes right up to the level of T67 and then goes into the cervical area. So what could be this uh, space? 
Another patient in the post-operative period, persistent hypotension in the post-operative period, successfully uh, uh, surgery done under lumbar epidural and then <coughs> under solo epidural, again L3, L4 catheterization and you can see the contrast which is lying in the thoracic area going up to the cervical area. If you see this is a blown up figure, you can see that this is a thoracic facet, this is the contrast in the query epidural space and delineates the posterior compartment, that is the contrast in the lateral compartment. So what is this compartment we are dealing with? This is something very unusual. Now, another patient who had uh, all the uh, contrast, again in the posterior epidural space, this is also questionable, no, nothing in the anterior epidural space, there is no delineation of the roots at all. So everything lying in the compartment. The surgery was being done, the uh, catheter was in situ, but again the patient had the same complaints of uh, hypotension in the, in the post-operative period. So we dissected few uh, cadavers and we found that the, there is a subdural space which is a narrow potential space between the arachnoid matter and the dura matter which could be very clearly delineated. Now this was in the cadavers but this does not occur in the human because uh, uh, the subdural space which it contains uh, amorphous material of low resistance with a low cohesion forces and it requires a lot of pressure. So if you inject with pressure, if you uh, insert the catheter with uh, some amount of pressure, it is likely to uh, go into the duro arachnoid interface. It's called as the duro arachnoid interface. Now, Raina and, and colleagues from Spain have studied a lot on this. This is the epidural space and that is the, the subdural space which has been created. So fissures are created in this space when you inject the drug with very high amount of pressure or you try to catheterize or you try to force in the catheter in the epidural space, you can probably land in the subdural space. So it extends from the S2 to cranial cavity. It has got a greater potential capacity dorsal and laterally. That's why the more commonly the contrast lies in the dorsal and in the lateral. It is widest in the cervical area, in the thoracic, thoracic cervical area, and it is the narrowest in the, uh, in, the, in the lumbar region. So it lies more commonly posteriorly, there is no anterior or lateral spread, and the posterior pulling of the drug which is more common. So the first case report was way back in 75, and there is a 0.82% incidence of subdural blocks. Excessive manipulation, prior back surgery, and uh, recent lum uh, lumbar puncture, these are the uh, predisposing factors. And if you rotate the epidural needle, some of them they have a habit of rotating the epidural needle. So that has, they can, can cause the, a subdural block. The onset is in between the subarachnoid and epidural, slow onset 15 to 20 minutes, duration is more than 2 hours and there is a slow progression uh, and moderate hypertension and, and respiratory arrest. But at times you can have different type of combinations like you have intercostals and upper extremity weakness, severe hypertension or sudden apnea, delayed onset and it can be unduly prolonged, a uh, block of uh, around 9 hours have been uh, reported in one of the literature and it can produce a brainstem anas anesthesia because the subdural space it goes right along the brain and comes so that is the reason why you have to be very careful during your epidural uh, cannulation. Now there are some needle tip placements, uh, there can be certain scenarios like the epidural needle pierces the dura but not the arachnoid, you can be in the subdural space then the epidural needle pierces both about the subdural and the subarachnoid. So it pierces the, uh, the, uh, the subdural space as well as it pierces the epidural space. Now in this, uh, you can see the contrast which did the root, that is definitely the epidural. But when you go uh, once a, a few uh, centimeters above, you can see the catheter coming in from the thoracic area. And there is a small gap here in between. So this could be the epidural space, that could be the subdural space. So you the catheter can be in two because it can, it's a multi-hole catheter. So it, one of the holes can lie in the epidural and one of the holes can lie in the subdural space space. So uh, uh, this is the multi-hole epidural catheter, so multi-compartment placement, can, one of the holes can be in the, uh, in the dura, can be in the subdural space and also can be in the uh, subarachnoid space. So this is called as a composite subarachnoid subdural block which can be uh, dense but at times it can produce problems in the perioperative period. So how can you recognize this? Uh, Sue, Ban Sue and colleagues who have been doing a lot of studies on neural stimulation technique of epidural space, uh, they, they propose that you can recognize the subdural space when there is diffuse motor response involving multiple segments at less than 1 milliampere. But this is again questionable because if, the, uh, if you have a uh, subarachnoid tap and the CCF comes and leaks out in the subdural space, then it doesn't correlate with your uh, motor response. Uh, one thing to be kept in mind is that it, uh, this subdural block has developed from 5 to 30 minutes to almost 40 minutes. So till the end of the 40 minutes, you need to be very, very careful when you have injected this, uh, uh, when you have injected this drug. Now, are there any criteria for coming to know whether you are really subdural is uh, the Lubino criteria where they have two major and three minor criteria. The major, crit uh, major criteria is a negative aspiration test, unexpected extensive sensory block, and the minor criteria is a delayed onset by 10 minutes and a variable motor response. If you have this both major criteria and one minor, that means that you might be in the subdural space. You need, need to keep this in mind. So uh, there is a four-step diagnostic uh, algorithm where, where the tactile feel of epidural or subarachnoid space, you know the feel of the ligamentum flammum or the dural click, they are totally different. So you need to know this. 
the amount of spread, if it is excessive, whether it is excessive, it is restricted or it is neither. You know, you need to know this. It is a failed block, whether it is uh, restricted, it is segmental or excessive, it, it can be uh, subdural. And a minor criteria one of these, it means that the, it means the, it, it, then you can correlate whether you are in the epidural, subdural or in the, uh, uh, in the uh, subarachnoid uh, sub space. So whenever you perform your epidurals, hence after, you, you need to be very careful doing catheterization in the perioperative period, in the immediate postoperative period, as well as when you keep the patients on the infusion pumps. Don't just don't go, don't go and relax at home. You have kept something like a time bomb, so you need to be uh, very, very careful and very, very vigilant, and you have to very, play very safe with your uh, epidural space. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Uh, definitely, I kept the time. Very interesting topics. I've got a couple of comments to make. Um, that, as Anis said, is I always felt that the anatomy is very important to us, and I don't know whether in the curriculum of our MD.